And welcome, everyone, to today's webinar. This is Rick Import for Siemens. Today's webinar, of course, is value-based purchasing. Are you ready? And our presenter today is Brady Augustine, and today's event is sponsored, of course, by Siemens. So it's good to have everybody here. What I'd like to do is just take a few seconds to review uh, some of the tools that WebEx offers to make sure that you are hearing us and we hear your questions and comments throughout today's session. So really quickly, if you're hearing my voice, you've heard this before, if you're hearing my voice on your computer speakers, you're fine, but if you'd like to dial into the teleconference, just click on the word request there on the right side of your screen or on the word communicate either way, and then on teleconference, join teleconference, you will then have a, uh, a phone number that is given in the dialog box along with an access code and an attendee ID number. Just follow the prompts and you will be led into the, um, the teleconference. In addition, we want to be sure that we can hear from you and we do that by using the word, the chat box right here on the right side of your screen. And uh, you use the chat box by typing in the small box and you'll see chats that come here in the big box. Susanna here at White Hat will be sending messages periodically. Uh, with links and so on uh, that you can see here in the chat box. But use the chat box. And in fact, please go ahead and send a chat now. Just type your name or where you're from or anything at all that you'd like to, to say just to be sure that, uh, that you know how to use the chat box. Following Brady's formal presentation, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. But please don't wait until the end of his presentation. Go ahead and ask them as they come in and uh, type your questions once again in the small box, and then you'll see them appear in the big, big box. Save this for your Q&A, but any comments that you want to send, use the chat box, okay? You will also be seeing a polling question. Uh, some questions appear uh, early on in today's session, and that will happen on the right side of your screen. Just make your selection, hit Submit, and then Brady will show you the responses as soon as they are available. After today's webinar, both PACE and Florida CEs will be available, and you will land on the evaluation, which you must complete to receive your PACE credit. You'll also be receiving an email with a link to the evaluation. So if, you're, if you've logged in and you have guests with you in your room, then be sure you make a list of who's with you so that you can forward that email with the evaluation evaluation link to them as well. That's how everybody will be able to receive their case plan. In addition, we are, of course, recording today's session, and both the recording and the PDF version of Brady's slides will be available at this URL, and uh, a little later on, Susanna will be putting this URL into the chat box so you can access the recording and download the slides. So for right now, I would like to turn the mic over to Nancy Gunther Orsati, the U.S. Marketing Manager with Siemens Healthcare Diagnostics, to give you a little bit of basics about today's topic. So, Nancy, good afternoon to you. Good morning, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining today's value-based purchasing webinar. As part of my job as Marketing Manager, I have the pleasure to travel throughout the United States and speak to clinicians just like you. I often ask, are you familiar with value-based purchasing? And most people that I speak with say yes and then direct me to their procurement department. Value-based purchasing is another set of core measures similar to OP16. It can reduce your reimbursement, provide negative publicity when metrics are publicized on various hospital compare websites, or you can be rewarded handsomely for understanding and meeting key metrics that CMS has set forth. Value-based purchasing is far less famous than its brother, OP16, but it did go into effect as of October 1st of this year. Value-based purchasing is trying to limit fragmented accountability. In your hospital, you may have the very best laboratory sitting right next to the very best emergency department, which is next to the very best nursing unit, which is next to the very best pharmacy but each department has its own physical space, its own budgets, its own employees, and its own management structures. Each department has a job to do and plays a very key role in overall patient care as well as the patient's experience. Value-based purchasing is, about, is a balancing act about quality and cost. 
what is the value? The value is the right care for the right person and at the right time. A quote from CMS that I thought was very fitting for today's presentation said that the best performing hospitals have low mortality, low readmission rates, and demonstrating that achieving these high quality of both outcomes is possible and setting a benchmark of care for performance. By sitting through today's presentation, we'll discuss how the 30-day readmission rate can affect you. And something that I learned in preparing for today's presentation is that one-fourth of all heart failure patients in the United States are readmitted within 30 days. That's a lot. And just like the outpatient and inpatient regulations, value-based purchasing is going to be focusing on cardiac, on heart failure, on AMI, and hospital-acquired conditions. And by sitting through this presentation today, you'll learn just by performing a routine urine screening how we can help maximize your reimbursement. And with that, I'll turn that back over to Rick and to Brady. Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, just give you a little quick rundown on Brady Augustine. Uh, Brady currently serves as president of Aggressive Analytics, a consulting firm that specializes in improving health system operations through internal performance improvement and external strategy development and execution. His background includes numerous leadership roles at the Centers for Medicine, Medicare, and Medicaid Services, where he served as senior advisor to the administrator and as the agency's kidney disease and transplantation czar. He served also as senior quality advisor, where he functioned as an agency lead for value-based purchasing, senior staff to the administrator's quality council, and chairman of the priorities work group responsible for leading CMS's breakthrough initiatives. During this time, Mr. Augustine led the development of the agency's flagship quality improvement activity, AV Fistula First, which is credited with saving over $2 billion, with a B, and 10,000 lives annually. Additionally, he was also appointed by the Secretary of Health and Human Services to the National Committee for Vital and Health Statistics, the Federal Advisory Committee responsible for health data, statistics, National Health Information Policy, and HIPAA. So without further ado, I will set up Mr. Augustine's slides. And actually, I will also open the very first poll that Brady will uh, go over with you shortly. So good afternoon, or good morning to you, Brady. Sounds great. Thank you very much, Rick. Yeah, you know, um, we're going to have a little bit of fun talking about value-based purchasing today, and kind of hard for me to believe I just said having fun talking about value-based purchasing. But VBP is not necessarily as important as it is to the healthcare community. It's not necessarily as complicated as many may think, and it's not necessarily as new as many may think as well. Many of the portions of value-based purchasing actually got their beginnings in the heyday of managed care back in the 90s, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. First off, we kind of have to think about what is value-based purchasing. Nancy talked about it a little bit, and there's definitely a disconnect between the people who take care of the bedside and people that work within the provider community and, and understanding about what value-based purchasing is. And basically what it is, I mean, the, the title itself, before value-based person, we called it payment for, for, for performance. It had other things. They were a little more market, had a little more marketing zest to them. Value-based person came from the Senate Finance Committee, and it's a, it's a term that only a governmental entity could come up with. Um, it's basically an, an attempt to pay for health care, health and health care, a little more like a marketplace. Because right now we pay the same regardless of the quality of care provided. Like think about when we go into a Best Buy or somewhere to buy something, there's a relationship between quality and the amount that we're willing to pay for something. That's so kind of what we're trying to do here as well. One of the challenges in healthcare is that healthcare uh, is a credence, what's called a credence good. And a credence good means it's like going to a mechanic. Oftentimes the people who receive services can't really evaluate quality um, during the activity, so others may do that for them. And that's what CMS and other payers are trying to provide information on quality to provide some information for uh, patients and persons uh, related to health care. And so here we go. We've got our first poll result in, or 
work, or actually both questions. The first is how familiar are you with value-based purchasing? And we see here that of the participants, about 50% are somewhat familiar, about 20% are very familiar, and about 30% are not familiar at all. And then the second poll question, are you aware of any quality initiatives underway at, at, a, at your particular organization related to value-based purchasing? And it's good to see 55% say yes, 10% say no, and about 30% are unsure. So we've got a pretty good understanding. I'll try to talk to where it makes value for, for everyone across the spectrum regarding value-based purchasing as we go through this presentation. One thing I would like to do first is I like to start every presentation with kind of a, a vignette. And it was one of the major challenges when I got to Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. I initially went there as the kidney disease and transplantations are. And there were initiatives that had been tried in the dialysis organizations amongst the provider community, of the rest of the provider community, about dialysis access. And this is how, you know, we actually gain access to a person's circulatory system for the purposes of dialysis. And it basically involves joining an artery and a vein or using a catheter. And there are three basic ways of doing so. You could either, one could either implement, put in place a catheter in the hospital setting, which costs $15,000, or one could put in place a graft, which is basically Gore-Tex that connects an artery and a vein, has two different connections, and it would pay like $4,000. And then you, we had an AV fistula, which is joining a native artery and vein together. It only had one connection. And because it only had one connection, it paid the least. Now, one of the problems that we had was catheters were most expensive, and they had twice as much in debt and twice as much in cost that follows from infections. The graft was okay. It was in the middle. It only took a little bit of follow-up to make sure it matured. But it also had infections related with it. The gold standard was the AV fistula. It had the lowest cost, the highest quality, and the best patient outcomes. And when we compared ourselves to the rest of the world, the rest of the world was around 80, 90 percent of the gold standard. We were at 15 percent. And it was all related to the incentives that, involved in, that were involved in the system. What we did is we sat down at the table with everyone that was involved from primary care docs to nephrologists to surgeons, to patient groups, to dialysis facilities, and so forth and so on. And what we found in issue is that everyone pointed the finger at everyone else. The nephrologist pointed to the primary care doc for not referring the person in a timely fashion, and then they pointed to surgeons for surgeons not, not putting in place what they had ordered. Surgeons pointed to facilities for not taking care of the access and blowing them when they actually punctured. And facilities pointed at patients saying the patients actually didn't take care of their access, and patients pointed at the pharmacists. So it was one of those situations where there was no incentive for people to do the right thing. And so we sat down, we started aligning incentives, we put in place the very first quality-based payment and issue and Medicare fee-for-service program. We developed a kind of a community of improvement for publishing papers, aligning incentives. And little, most people don't know, ESRD, the dialysis payment system for Medicare, is actually the first payment system to implement value-based purchasing in all of Medicare systems. And what we've seen since then over the course of the last seven years are rates of that gold standard have improved from about 15% to 60, around 65%, which translates to about $2 billion every five years and about 1,000 lives saved annually. So there's an opportunity if we can get people to work together toward a common good and the betterment of the patient, there's an opportunity to save money and save lives at the same thing. And that's the holy ground for those who work in quality. We want quality to pay. Quality pays. So with that as my vignette, we may refer back to that at a few occasions later on in our presentation. So here's our sponsors. First, Siemens, a global leader in diagnostics and technology, tons of information and tons of support for the provider community in order to meet these change this, meet the needs of this changing environment. That the Society for Cardiovascular Patient Care, which offers accreditation for facilities, certification for hospital professionals, improvement and support services, focus on cardiovascular disease. And then Progressive Analytics, the organization that I lead, which provides support for healthcare organizations in this changing value-driven marketplace.
So basically, I want to first want to talk about what is the value conundrum. I think I touched on a little bit when we went to our vignette. We'll talk a little bit about value-based purchasing. It's a difficult, it's a challenging, uh, but promising solution. We'll talk about the impacts and opportunities, kind of where the rubber hits the road. And there's actually not one value-based purchasing program from CMS. There's actually three of them that all try to align incentives and payment with uh, improved patient outcomes. <clears throat> so one of my favorite quotes here is from Dr. Berwick, who was a former administrator at CMS. Dr. Berwick is the president of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, one of the leading organizations in improving care in the country. And this quote is great. So healthcare has no intrinsic value at all. Health does. It's kind of part of what we've seen about a transition from talking about health care to talking more about health. Joy does, peace does, the best health care is the very least health care we need to gain a long, full, and joyous lives that we want. The best hospital bed is empty, not full. The best scan is one we don't need to take. So, and we realign the payment system to focus more on health as opposed to health care, it changes the value dynamic, and that's kind of what we'll be talking about more. My particular aha moment was back in 2003, even though I've been working on a value-based person or what we call at the time payment for performance at a health plan. In this report, it talked about health professions education. The report recommended that students and medical professionals develop and maintain proficiency in these five areas, patient center care, working in part teams, practicing evidence-based medicine, focusing on quality improvement, and using information technology. Wow, you know, it was kind of a, it kind of really hit me hard during that presentation that none of this was reimbursable. The system had to change. Also, a recent, one other thing that was interesting is about the same time a paper came out from, I think, Health Affairs, and it said that half of hospital boards rated quality of care, only less than half of hospital boards rated quality of care as one of their top two priorities, and only a minority of board members had reported having any healthcare quality training or experience. So we had an issue all throughout organizations. People were blind with payment, payment. The boards were focusing more on doing things to people and not necessarily doing things for people. And so we had to have a, a tectonic shift in how provider organizations were organized, how they were led, and how that translated to the front line to patient care. So this is one of the more telling charts we'll ever see with regard to, to value. This looks at a composite measure for recommended care for patients hospitalized with acute myocardial infarction, heart failure, and pneumonia. And on the X-axis, we're looking at state-level Medicare spending per beneficiary. And then the Y-axis, we're looking at that composite quality score. And we see that there's basically, in this regard, a negative value. In fact, a major paper from the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission came out around 2007, and it basically made the same point. It said that fee-for-service payment systems had a neutral, if not negative, impact uh, effect on quality. And that means we were paying for the wrong things. And in fact, there was an IOM report came out around that same time, 2005, that said its conclusion was for the sizable investments we make in healthcare services, we should be getting much greater value for, for a dollar. So here's another example. The last one looks at kind of a process measure. This is going to look at an outcome measure. Where's the value in terms of outcomes? Now, in this one, we're looking at uh, infant mortality. That's for 1,000 live, live births. This is comparing the United States and the various states within the United States. Those are black boxes. The OECD countries, that OECD stands for Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And that's 34 countries that are kind of our peers in the world. And what we see here is this is a little more complicated because there actually is a relationship between fewer deaths, better outcomes, and more payment in the United States. But when you com we compare ourselves to the rest of the world, we'll see that we're twice as bad in terms of outcomes, and we spend twice as much as well. So, 
Another one of my favorite quotes, I try to shoehorn this in just about every presentation I give. It's from Winston Churchill. His quote is, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And that's kind of what we're doing with value-based purchasing. There's a major presentation given by Dr. McClellan. He was the CMS administrator back in 2005. And one of the great things that he said was he gave a major speech on which to us is kind of a no-brainer. Anyone who's worked in health care, it's a no-brainer. But for the federal government, it was kind of a major shift. He said that CMS was a public health agency, not a claims payment shop. Um, and he's absolutely correct that CMS's payment systems have more of an impact on public health than probably CDC, FDA, and others. Okay, but it was a major change in the way CMS saw how it did business at the time. And he said, well, the problem is physicians want, who want to improve care, who want to work as part of teams, don't have the resources or flexibility of the payment to do so. And so his solution, his proposed solution, which CMS has acted on since that time, was linking a portion of payments to valid measures of quality and effective use of resources will give us those incentives to implement those innovative ideas and approaches that actually result in improvements. So what is value-based purchasing and how does it kind of compare to what we've heard in the past? We've heard the terms payment for performance and things of that nature. The concept of value-based purchasing is that buyers, people who purchase care, which could be insurers, which could be businesses, if they're self-insured, could be persons or patients. That the people who buy health care hold providers accountable for both cost and quality. Folks on using the system to reduce inappropriate care and to identify and reward high-value systems of care. So it tries to incorporate where as many payment for performance programs really just looked at quality measures. They didn't really incorporate anything regarding efficiency or, uh, or cost of care. And so value-based person tries to incorporate both of those into one, uh, one program. So the trend of value, this is a great, this is the Porter and Teesburg uh, book or article, which was turned into a book around, in, uh, around 2005, 2006, and it talks about the trend to value. In the past, our focus was on reducing costs and, re and avoiding costs. And it was on many of us who either worked in the provider community with managed care, remember those intense negotiations. And it was really focused on cost shifting, bargaining power, rationing. It, it really didn't focus on quality or on outcomes or on bringing value to the, to the marketplace. And there was a lot of focus on, on legal recourse and regulation. Now we're kind of in this world, we're kind of moving between the present and the future there was a focus in the present time about reducing errors, enabling choice, things of that nature. The focus was on, for example, choice of health plan, focus on, on specific hospital and provider practices, looking at things in, individually, not as part of a more holistic unit. So, and that's kind of what we're moving from. There's big debates within CMS and with the community at large, the measurement community, about how well should we really measure and hold individual providers accountable or should we really try to focus more on building systems of care and holding those systems accountable because they were able to affect or impact the transitions of care, the communication, the coordination of care that one provider couldn't do. And that's the, that's the environment we're moving into, we're focusing on the nature of competition. Competition is at the level of specific disease and conditions for example, for cardiovascular care, for example, HIV AIDS, one thing I'm working on right now is working on setting up a specialty plan in for Medicaid and also some of these are developing in for Medicare on HIV AIDS. Another one on cancer care. There's a cancer ACO forming in the state of Florida. So there's these focuses around comp competing at the level of specific diseases and conditions. All distinctive strategies by payers and providers trying to set, them, set themselves apart from others in order to really achieve greater, better outcomes. One thing that, that many measurement people don't want to admit is that measurement, part of measurement or provision of care is really both an art and a science. 
to this day, with about 30 or 40 percent of, of health care actually has a basis in evidence and science. The rest kind of is either just what people have always done in the past or there's some part to some of this. And so we're getting away from the world where CMS is kind of dictating care through its payment policies, which we don't want the government really dictating care toward saying, hey, here's a global payment. We're going to put some incentives on it. We have expectations. You're going to meet these quality measures. You health provider or accountable care organization or other provider community, provider system, we want you to figure out how best to provide care and improve outcomes. And that's kind of where we're moving at presently. So as we talk about those types of systems forming, one of the major discussions today is about kind of a risk continuum. This is from a, a nice paper um, from the Commonwealth Fund, and it talks about the continuum of organization and the continuum of bundling. So we talk about how much we can really kind of hold someone accountable. It's kind of hard if we're talking about independent practices. We kind of have to pay them fee for service, which is, let me grab my little pencil here, which is right about here on our, in our chart. We move to primary care group practices. We can kind of hold them for a little bit of a global fee for primary care. We move up into hospital systems. We can hold them accountable for some, like, for example, DRGs. And we're going to try to fo focus more on some of the discussion we have later about readmissions kind of forces hospital systems to kind of reach outside this box into the realm of less feasible, get it to work here, in this area, because, it's, you know, from the one DRG payment, we're expecting hospitals to actually reach out in the community and reduce readmissions. But what, with the accountable care organizations and others, these kind of systems forming, there's a focus on kind of paying more of a global payment for enrolling and really setting those expectations high in terms of quality. So, some of the early decision points that we had in these programs, what, what, what type of incentives were we going to use? Were we going to do non-financial? Some of the initial ones were non-financial, public reporting, feedback reports, things of that nature. And then there was the financial, which were creating incentives, and both of them were. I mean, the non-financial reporting within the provider community. <clears throat> many providers, many organizations, they don't want to look poor compared to their peers. But the financial does have an impact. The financial, one of the things that's, that's of interest is that <clears throat> one of the things in healthcare and still true today is we have to kind of follow the money. That, that many people, most people, not all people at the front lines care about patients and care about what happens to people and their families. But organizations have leadership and they set tones and create cultures and it helps to line incentives between the financial, the operations, and the clinical side when there's both a altruistic commitment to patients, but also a financial commitment to, to achieving the best outcomes. The next question we had to think, we had to decide very early on was whether or not we're talking about meeting benchmarks or attainment of certain levels of care or quality measures or improvement targets or both, and <clears throat> one of the things here was that if we focused on attainment, like reaching 85% or 90% or 80% or whatnot, then those persons at the bottom, 10%, 20%, wherever, they would have absolutely no incentive to improve because there's no way they're going to go from 20% to 80%. So one of the initial decisions was, hey, let's, let's both do both. Let's create some incentive in, in terms of reaching those benchmarks, but another incentive for those in, at near the bottom or below, unable to achieve that benchmark, that they have an, an incentive to improve. And that was the decision with the hospital value-based purchasing program. Also, another early decision was whether to use fixed or relative targets. By fixed meaning someone would have to improve 10% um, per year, and percentage points per year, something of that nature, whereas relative is more like 10% over what they were at before. 
So if someone had 10% starting off, had a 90% opportunity for improvement, to reduce that by 10%, you get too mathematical, but that means they'd have to show 9% improvement. So they'd have to go from 10 to 19. If someone starts off at 90%, there's only 10% opportunity for improvement. They reduce that by 10%, which is 1 percentage point. They would have to go from 90 to 91. So whether or not we're going to have fixed or relative targets, um, that was an early decision as well. How to pay, whether it's an add-on, a withhold, a corridor, or shared savings. Various insurers have used various models. In most government instances, it's a withhold for budgeting purposes. But I've seen other insurers use add-ons. And the organization I worked at 20 years ago, the health plan, we used a quality corridor. We would pay, make payments, and plus or minus 20% of that payment uh, was related to quality. And then shared savings as well. Most of these accountable care organizations that CMS is setting up, um, their systems of care at the present time have networks that don't really necessarily know the patients they're caring for. They're kind of assigned post hope, um, but they are, have to meet certain quality targets. And in doing so, if they are actually shared savings from improved uh, efficiency, then the federal government, Medicare, will share those with those provider uh, organizations. And some of those provider organizations, many of them are provider-based, i.e. from the physician community. Some are integrated delivery system or hospital-based. And they both exist in Medicare and also in Medicaid. Many Medicaid programs have them as well. So what types of measures, process, outcome, or structure? Structure is based on whether or not something exists, whether or not you have an EHR in place, uh, whether or not you have a protocol in place. Structure measure, often those measures are asked from various accrediting bodies. Process measure is whether or not something occurs. An outcome is kind of the outcome of care, mortality, morbidity, rehabilitation, um, quality of life, things of that nature. Also, whether or not we're talking, we're going to focus on preventative, acute, or chronic care. What type of adjustment, if any, risk adjustment, stratification or exclusion. Risk adjustment typically is for outcomes measures to try to compare apples to apples as best possible in a hospital setting. What type of provider individuals or groups or systems, as I said earlier, and what type of data we're going to use. A lot of discussions early on about whether to wait for electronic health records before we make a major push into value-based purchasing and, and the decision was made that we should move more quickly and uh, implement it through administrative purposes, for example, the various HIPPICS codes that are used for quality um, today in the physician community. And then uh, the rest are reported to CMS from clinical information and or and or at administrative information. So we're moving toward a world where it will come directly from EHR. CMS has a pilot today called the QRDA, Audio Related Data Architecture, I guess, where individual organizations can submit quality data to CMS directly from their EHRs. So after all this discussion seven, eight years ago, Medicare Congress finally made its move with the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005, and it was the first, it started the first prong of the value-based purchasing paradigm at CMS when it implemented the hospital-acquired conditions payment change starting in 10-1-2008. And it authorized HHS CMS to develop a plan to implement value-based purchasing in the hospital setting, and that was actually, I believe, reported out in 2007. The Affordable Care Act of 2010 moved the ball as well. In fact, there was one in between there called NIPA 2008, I believe, that implemented, directed CMS to implement the program to do value-based purchasing for dialysis facilities. And that was the first major BBP program that, that CMS has put in place. So the Affordable Care Act, Direct the CMS to evaluate hospital performance based on it, both achievement and improvement. Start making value-based payments starting October 1st, 2012, which is this month. Establish the readmissions reduction program starting October 1st, 2012, this month. Directed the HHS to establish community-based care transitions program. And this is basically where 
hospitals that have high readmissions rates can have access to uh, community-based, not-for-profit organizations to help assist with transitions of care, and also provide the status of these travel care organizations that, we, that we've talked about a little bit on this converse, in this conversation under what they call the Maker Share Shared Savings Program, as well as there's some pilots and demonstrations that CMS has to, to, to address travel care organizations as well. So, all right. One, another great quote. This is kind of the intent of the entire program is to make the chief financial officer of individual organizations a quality champion. And this is one of the seven leadership leverage points for organizational improvement in healthcare from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. So first, that first problem we've talked about, the first one to be implemented was hospital acquired conditions. Hospital acquired this particular problem of value based purchasing started fiscal year, federal fiscal year 2009. This is what it looks like for the last year, 2012, and then these bold ones, the surgical site infection following cardiac implantable electronic device, that's a new one for fiscal year, federal fiscal year 2013, which started October 1st. And then the, the other one that's bold is also new for federal fiscal year 2013. Now, also, one thing to mention here real quick, this also exists in the Medicaid setting. This is not just in Medicare. In fact, most private commercial insurers have followed suit in this regard as well. In Section 2702 of the Affordable Care Act, it kind of directed Medicaid programs to implement the same thing. They may call it something different. It's called Provider Preventable Conditions in the Medicaid program. CMS has said it will not pay states for these conditions through Medicaid and it gives states flexibility to implement their own additional uh, ones as well through what they call their state plans. So um, HACs may be referred to as P PPCs, or Provider Preventable Conditions in Medicaid, uh, but it's still it's the same basic premise. So let's go through two real-world examples for how this actually impacts an individual hospital. So this is a surgical example. We're talking about a total hip replace, replacement, procedure code 8151. And we've got a principal diagnosis, osteoarthritis, and a secondary diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. And what happens when someone's admitted, they're going to have this POA. POA means present on admission. So when someone's admitted, there's going to be, with the diagnosis, there'll be a POA status indicator. In this case, we're talking about wine in yes or no. Basically means that when a person was admitted to the hospital, they had a pulmonary embolism already. And it could have been, have been in an outpatient setting. It could have happened in the ED. It could have happened, you know, outpatient unit. So when they were admitted to the inpatient setting, they had a pulmonary embolism. In that regard, the DRG payment, it's what's called a major complication of comorbidity. So it's a different payment. It's MSDRG 469, which has an average payment of $18,000. Now, the way the DRGs are set up, there's 750 different DRGs, and they're supposed to pay for a set of services with relative, with the same amount of relative resource intensity and the same kind of clinical coherence, I think is the phrase that CMS uses. And in this regard, the pulmonary embolism kind of kicked up the payment to $18,000. Without that pulmonary embolism, since in the second example, in the second row, the POA status was no, meaning it was not present on admission. It actually happened during the hospital stay. Say, say, CMS is not going to kick up the payment more for that. It's going to hold the hospital accountable for that occurring during the inpatient stay. In that regard, it goes to MSDRG 470 which is without the major complication or comorbidity, and the average payment is $11,000, or a little more than $11,000. So here's a medical example. This is viral pneumonia, unspecified. Someone had a UTI during the stay. If it was present on admission, they allow for the extra payment. It would be a complication of comorbidity, and the average payment is $5,300. If it was not present on admission, it happened during the hospital stay, the hospital gets penalized or does not receive additional payment for that poor quality that happened during the stay, 
and therefore it's paid MSDRG195, which is about $3,700. So in both these cases, about 30-40% uh, payment reduction relative to the services that are performed in the hospital setting. So that's the Hospital Acquiring Condition Program. Let's talk a little about the second prong, which is the Readmission Reduction Program. In this program, CMS reduces payments to hospitals with excess readmissions effective October 1st, starting this year, this month, for federal fiscal year 2013. In the rule, in the final rule of the CMS issue, it's going to use three measures initially, 30-day readmission measures for acute myocardial infarction, heart failure, and pneumonia for this fiscal year, starting October 1st, and next fiscal year. It defines what a readmission is. It may not have, it doesn't have to be for the same condition. That's another major change here. Um, and then it uses three years of discharge data. In fact, the, the, the source data it uses in this first year, and it's published in the link at the bottom of the slide, actually shows the readmission adjustment factors for individual hospitals across the country. The, the time period that was used to compute this was from what July 1st, 2008, through June 30th, 2011, so a three-year period. And the one thing, important thing to note here is that the penalty starts at 1% for this fiscal year starting this month, all the way to 3% in 2015 and on at the present. So that will only grow. And value-based purchasing, this is the third prong. Uh, it starts this month as well. We're in, Medicare is going to start making incentive payments to hospitals based on the performance starting this year on 12 clinical process measures and eight measures of patient experience. Those are these CAP surveys that we hear a lot about, kind of transformed how many hospitals uh, take uh, care of patients at the bedside. This program is funded by 1% withhold from participating hospitals DRG payments. One of the things that's interesting to note here, the baseline period, because we're talking about they have to do improvement, so the time period is here. The performance period was from July 1st, 2011 to June to March 31st, 2012. So basically kind of like a nine-month period. Two years previous to that was the baseline, when they did the baseline period for measurement. And then at least 60 days prior to October 1st, CMS is going to release through its quality net program from the QIOs, we're going to release individual hospital performance. And that individual hospital performance has been released to the hospitals. And uh, on November 1st, 2012, hospitals will be notified of their exact value-based purchasing uh, payments. And, in fact, their report, that report after that hospitals have been notified, will be also released to the public. So this kind of gives us an overview and we're talking about here, uh, maybe a little bit hard to see, but we'll see up until federal fiscal year 2014, we're using clinical, 70% of the value-based person payment is based on clinical process of care, and 30% is based on patient experience. At the top, we kind of see what the when preliminary value-based person scores are notified when they're actually computed. And we see that over the, over the years, in fact, starting in 2014, that value-based person payment is going to be clinical process of care, outcomes, and patient experience. So outcomes are incorporated in fiscal year, federal fiscal year 2014. As we see here as well, the value-based, just like with the readmission reduction program, the value-based purchasing program increases a little bit over time from 1% in fiscal year 2013 all up to 2% in 2017. So between those two programs, we're talking 5% of hospital payment will be at risk in the out years. Let's look at what these, these are for fiscal year 2013 and 2014. In 2013, the STAR actually represents a measure that's in the 2014 program that is not in the 2013 program. We're actually in fiscal year 2013 right now. So the ones that have the STAR are the ones that apply to this year. All, the entire list applies to next fiscal year. So we've got some related to AMI. We've got the heart failure one discharge instructions. We've got some pneumonia measures and some VTE measures. 
we look at the patient experience of care dimensions, that is 30% of the total, what's called a total performance score. The, the kind of the, the value-based purchasing and lingo is that the improvement targets, performance targets, and these, all of these measures we brought together in one total performance score for a hospital that will be used to help inform this value-based purchasing payment. And here's the patient experience of care dimensions from that survey I mentioned earlier, the CAPS survey or HCAPS, um, communication with nurses, doctors, pain management, illness, discharge information, overall rating in the hospital. And starting in 2014, the outcomes domain will be 25%. So this doesn't apply to fiscal year 2013. This outcome, the outcomes measures actually start being applied in 2014. And in here, we've got, so earlier in the readmission reduction program, we had payments tied to readmissions for AMI, heart failure, and pneumonia. Here, in starting in 2014, outcomes measures for those will be incorporated as well for AMI, heart failure, and pneumonia. So when we think about these programs in the AMI and heart failure setting, which our organizations have a lot of input into, an impact on an opportunity from, we see that for heart failure, for example, there's an outcomes measure here that's involved in the value-based purchasing payment. There's the heart failure discharge instructions measure that's incorporated in the clinical process measure for value-based purchasing payment. There are some things related to heart failure or cardiovascular surgery that are involved in the hospital-acquired conditions payment. And then the readmission payment also has a readmission within 30 days for heart failure patients as well. So here we've got cutting across a particular condition. There's huge impacts across the settings and huge opportunity. Whenever I say impact, I always think opportunity for, for programs who are really focused on improving care in the hospital setting and also incorporating the community setting as well. So with that, I think we are done, and we'll have some conversation and um, answer some questions, and hope we'll all learn a bit from it. Well, thank you very much, Brady. That was a wonderful job. This is Rick again very quickly. I'd like to just uh, introduce Nancy back to you, Nancy Gunther Orsati, U.S. Marketing Manager for Siemens Healthcare Diagnostics. I'll open up your phone, and you're all set to go, Nancy. Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you so much, Brady. Um, Value-based purchasing is something that's affecting each of us right now. It's not a measure that will be coming in the future, but it's coming there today. And with heart failure and AMI and readmission rates, and heart failure being one of the number one items that CMS is looking for, um, Siemens has something called the Stratus CS that's available to be put into your laboratory or into your emergency department that can help you measure cardiac stat, cardiac stat markers in order to help you with your patients, to help you decide whether you're going to discharge them, whether to admit them, whether to put them into the cath lab, etc. So here's a photo just to let you know of what the Stratus CS looks like, and it is a solution that Siemens has that may be able to help you with this type of testing in the future. One of the things that we do with Siemens is we always strive for quality outcomes. We focus everything around quality and in the patient. The Stratus CS has a high sense troponin that helps with risk stratification. It's an instrument that has the same reference range as your core lab, so it harmonizes very well. It meets the guidelines for your 99th percentile and your 10th percent TV, which simply means how low can it go and how repeatable is it at that low range. The guidelines of the 99th percentile and 10 percent CV are listed by the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology. Another great place to look for guidelines is the Society for Chest Pain or some of your peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Fred Apple has written many papers as well as Dr. Dr. Rob Christensen, cardiologist from the University of Maryland. Here's a product overview of the Stratus. It's available for near patient testing and for the lab. Um, it's an easy instrument that can, you can walk away with results in 14 minutes, and it has an assay menu of seven tests including troconin, myoglobin, CKMB, a beta HCG, D-dimer, nt pro BMP, and high-sensitive C-reactive protein. But 
enough of uh, Stratus I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about value-based purchasing. The whole point of value-based purchasing is to reduce readmissions, to focus on AMIs, and to focus on heart failure patients. And I'm going to show you some ways in which you could find out how your hospital ranks in readmissions throughout other hospitals in the United States. But first, just some of the benefits of point-of-care cardiac testing. But having this point-of-care cardiac testing can help you with your patients with quicker diagnosis, faster treatments. In the emergency room, it could decrease turnaround time for bed turns um, and decrease length of stays. In the lab, it provides you with matching methods in your overall hospital with increasing bed turns and shorter length of stays, it can help with your financial benefits, have happier customers, and better overall clinical outcomes. But this is really what I wanted to show you today, and if you have a pen available, you may want to write down this website that I'm about to share with you. On this resource, you can look at readmission rates for hospitals throughout the United States. What this website does is it takes data that it gets from CMS and crunches it um, in three different ways. It can crunch it with your hospital referral regions, hospital service areas, by state, or just by your own hospital. And for example, what I'm showing you here is your hospital referral region. Here you can see that Johnson City, Tennessee, Monroe, Louisiana, Fort Smith, Arkansas, Munster, Indiana, are all some of the highest readmission rates in the country. The national average for readmission rates is 18.5%. And you can see many of the cities listed right here or hospital reference ranges or referral regions that are way above the national average. And then here you can actually look by state name. I'm from New York, and I was very surprised to see that New York, New Jersey, D.C. have some of the highest readmission rates within the country. So what you can do is you can get your pen out and you can write down dartmouthatlas.org. Start mouthatlas.org, which you can go free of charge without any additional um, sign-ins or logons, and be able to check how you rate in the country, your city, your state, or your particular facility. And this can help you see how much room you're going to need to adjust in terms to be have a lower rate for value-based purchasing and a lower readmission rate throughout the United States. So with that, in addition to having cardiac solutions, Siemens has some great products in your analysis to help you. Value-based purchasing brings a renewed focus to hospital-acquired conditions. For the catheter-associated urinary tract infection, hospitals will need to be able to document the presence of UTIs prior to hospital admission in order to prove that the infection was not hospital-acquired in order to protect the reimbursement of dollars. Your analysis testing, in fact, is an expensive, reliable means of documenting UTIs. Siemens Healthcare Diagnostics offers the most comprehensive urinalysis portfolio on the market. Our proven multi-six urine reagent strips can be analyzed on any one of our family of Clinitech analyzers from the Clinitech Status Plus to the Clinitech Advantage to the Clinitech AUWI, providing hospitals with an optimal set of solutions for UTI detection from the hospital point of care departments to the central lab. If you would like to know more about any of these products, you can answer that question on your survey. And with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Brady. Thank you, Nancy. This is Rick. I'll open up Brady's mic as well. And we are ready for questions, and the timing is just perfect. We have just a few minutes and several questions, so right to them. Uh, Brady, <clears throat> the first question is, what types of measures will directly affect women and children? Women and children? Well, at, at, at least initially, most of the measures apply across uh, the various genders, and many of them do not, at least initially, focus on um, the under the under 18 or 18 and under age group. And part of that is, is the measures are not as well formed for that community as they are for the adults, primarily because a lot of the data used to form the measures come from Medicare. I know in the Medicaid population, we have Medicaid measures for from HEDIS, the National, Quality, uh, National Committee for Quality Assurance and others, and many state Medicaid programs have very robust measure sets for children. But in these particular measure sets, since it's Medicare-related, most of them are not going to be focused on children, at least 
initially. There may be some, hopefully, some focus on disability in the future, but uh, as of now, none of the Medicare value-based perks are really applicable to specifically to those populations. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And this is a very good question. Uh, and actually, there are there's, there are two questions that I will combine into one. Who gets penalized if a patient goes to a different hospital within a 30-day window with the same problem? And the uh, other question is, which hospital is penalized, the first hospital or the second? The first one gets penalized, and it starts as an index. I'm, if I remember correctly, because there's a few different ways of measuring this, but my understanding is the first hospital would actually it would count against them and their readmission rate, and it would start a new readmission rate for the second hospital. So let's say if two readmissions happened within 30 days, that first hospital, the index hospital, would have two counts against them. The second hospital, which there would be one following them, would actually have a new index, and actually they would have one count against them. And the expectation here is really that hospital systems really create these, they are such a large part of their healthcare community that they build these networks um, to, in order to coordinate care, these community transition type programs so that it may not necessarily be fair, but it's the way they're paying and it's kind of the way things are moving forward that there's an expectation of the hospital performing services in their local communities. Excellent. Thank you. Hopefully that answers both of those questions. Next, is there, are there any models in which facilities can calculate the savings and or reduction in CMS readmission penalties? I mean, well, we've got, we actually have the actual Excel spreadsheet that has what each hospital's readmission penalty is going to be. And one interesting thing to know, one important thing to know is in the readmission reduction program, it's a two, you know, it's a withhold. So we'll never make back what, what was withheld. We can only be necessarily a loser, but the people we serve, our beneficiaries, our patients, are the winners. So that's different. The value-based purchasing program is supposed to be budget neutral. So if a hospital excels, it can get more than its 2% withhold back. But the entire 2% has to be distributed. And so there's papers that come out recently that said that, you know, Lake Wobegon, most everyone's average, most hospitals will end up within a little teeny few microscope points away from what they, that 2%. And that some will be above and some will be below, but that's only going to increase over time. That focus and that discriminative power that CMS has as they get more data. So I don't know of any particular models that model that today quite intently, um, but I do know there's a lot of organizations that are putting a lot of work into it to provide those support services to hospitals and other providers in order to help gauge their decision-making process. And in those models are quite helpful and quite valuable. Thank you, Brady. We're reaching our witching hour, so let me just throw one more question, quick question in. Uh, isn't it true that the next generation of measures per statute, probably, must, per, must be posted on hospital compare for one year prior to CMS selection? That is correct. They, uh, the measures, and they, in fact, we could have gone into future potential measures, but, but the way it works is CMS and the way it's, CMS has been directed that they have to at least publicly report through hospital compare measures for at least a year before they are eligible to be in, put in place into the value-based purchasing program. That's absolutely correct. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Brady and Nancy. We have uh, we've reached our time limit here today, so let me quickly remind you that when you leave, when you log out, you will land on the evaluation for PACE. And for Florida CEs, let me uh, caution you, please, that if you are in Florida and would like Florida laboratory CEs, uh, you will need to in, uh, type in your license number as well. 
please be sure to double check your email addresses when you enter them. And uh, once we receive your evaluations, we will send the certificates out, typically within 48 hours. So please fill everything out right away. Don't wait so that you can receive your certificate without holding everybody else's up. And also the recording and slides from today's session uh, will be posted shortly, probably by the end of the day, right here at whitehatcom.com forward slash Siemens. Uh, Susanna has, will probably be putting um, be putting the link in here in just a second. Actually, she already has, so thank you very much for that. We thank you all very much for coming, and Brady and Nancy, great presentations, both of you. We look forward to seeing all of you again at another Siemens-sponsored webinar. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you again. Great. Thank you very much, Rick. Bye-bye.